Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The New Science of Learning, Effective Approaches for Older Students with Autism and Attention Disorders, featuring Dr. Martha Burns. I'm Clay Whitehead, the co-CEO and co-founder of Presence Learning. We provide live online speech therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral interventions, and mental health services, and assessment services as well, to schools and families across the nation. Today's webinar was inspired by the feedback we have regularly gotten from you, our listeners, on the large need for more information on techniques and best practices in working with older students. We have heard you and are delighted to bring you Dr. Burns, who is a national expert on the topic. As the author of over 100 articles and multiple books, neuroscientist Dr. Burns is a leading expert on language, brain development, and how children learn. She speaks frequently on the importance of applying the science of learning in early childhood education and in the K-12 classroom. Dr. Burns is adjunct associate professor at Northwestern University and a fellow of the American Speech Language Hearing Association. She has also served on the medical staff of Evanston Northwestern Hospital for 35 years. She has consulted with school districts worldwide on ways to apply neuroscience to best practices in education. With that, the floor is yours, Dr. Burns. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you to Presence Learning for sponsoring this workshop entitled The New Science of Learning, Effective Approaches for Older Students with Autism and Attention Disorders. I'm going to be addressing this topic. I think all of you probably know why it's important, but brain science is playing a larger and larger part in our ability to both understand how autism spectrum disorders differ from other kinds of learning disorders as well as from children who are learning typically. It also helps us to understand how attention and self-regulation pose real learning challenges for adolescents. These are usually skills that we associate with what we call executive functions, prefrontal lobe activities that mature starting around adolescence and are a particular problem in children on the autism spectrum. And then, of course, we're interested in how our services can be individualized to meet each student's unique needs, because one of the things that neuroscience is helping us understand is that students on the autism spectrum are quite variable. There's quite a bit of difference from student to student, and the older they get, the more those differences become evident. We also want to help our students in general to pay closer attention to oral instruction because that's how we're going to drive the brain to mature and that's how we're going to enable these students to become able to hold jobs and able to function socially within the environment. Self-regulation is essential, we know, because that's the ability to delay gratification for long-term goals to be able to plan, to be able to organize. We're going to talk a lot about how we can help our students develop those skills, how we can get their assignments completed on time, because many of our students are mainstreamed into many classes where they will be competing with other students for assignments and grades. And finally, obviously, we want to meet their educational goals and prepare them either for higher education or for some kind of, of employment. The learning outcomes I think you've reviewed. Um, we're going to apply new research on neuroscience to autism spectrum. We're going to understand how instructional and, tech and technological interventions can maximize both attention in the classroom and outside of the classroom to drive better results. And then also we're going to be able to implement our instructional tools and methods to enhance these students' ability to regulate themselves and decrease the amount of behavioral management issues that we have in our classrooms. So let's begin by discussing brain maturation. I think many of you are familiar with this view of the human brain. This was actually a map of the human brain that was developed by Broadman and published in 1910. So it's over 100 years old, but it is so accurate that it's still used by neurologists today, whether they're using brain imaging techniques or other kinds of even using brain maps to guide surgery. It is Brodman's map that we all kind of adhere to. And the reason I want to show you this map to start with is it outlines for you in color 
especially over on the right-hand side, you can see that there are specific areas of the brain that are very important for sensory functions, like area 312, which is that kind of turquoise area right behind the Rolandic fissure, if you're familiar with that, that main dividing line between the front of the brain and the back of the brain. And that area is primary sensation from the body. In the very back of the brain, that turquoise number 17 is the primary visual area of the brain in the occipital lobe. And then if you look at that kind of salmon-colored area in the top of the temporal lobe, area 41 is primary area for hearing. And then these areas are all surrounded by what we call sensory association areas. And those are the areas where we use the brain to perceive, to make sense out of what we've seen or felt or heard. The frontal lobe is the area of the brain in front of the Rolandic fissure, in front of that dividing line, and it's pink in the very back part of the frontal lobe and then kind of a beige in the front, beige and yellow. And the beige and yellow regions are the regions we're going to be addressing to a great extent in this course because those are the parts of the brain that are going to regulate attention and other executive functions like self-regulation, self-control. Now, those frontal lobe areas called the prefrontal cortex, that beige area especially, matures very slowly. It's still maturing into our 30s. So the advantage to the fact that it matures slowly is that it gives us lots of time to work with our students especially students on the autism spectrum who may have brains that are maturing a little more slowly, gives us time to work with them and develop some of these capacities. And the brain is a experience-dependent organ. It is plastic. It changes based on what we do with it. So we as educators have a profound effect on how the brain develops and matures, especially this frontal lobe, which matures later during adolescence. This slide shows what we call networks in the brain. This is a slide that was done by Joy Hirsch at Columbia University. You can see that it's from her Columbia fMRI lab. And what it shows is that dispersed regions of the brain, like that top of the temporal lobe that I talked about, and then the kind of yellow areas that you saw, if I go up back to this slide, those yellow areas, 40, 44, and 45 in the frontal lobe, those areas are all connected together by long fiber tracks, and the neurons fire synchronously in networks, similar to how you're listening to this course at a great distance, but because of cellular networks and because of other kinds of networks that we have available, we're able to communicate in real time, and the brain does it the same way. And these networks have to develop over time, and they develop based on experience. So this object naming network you're looking at would be different if you spoke Russian. It would be different if you spoke German. It would be different if you spoke Japanese. Those areas might light up synchronously in about the same areas, but the way the brain has organized itself would be different based on your experiences. Now, as I said, those regions that you saw light up are all connected together by fiber tracks. And the fiber tracks are the superhighways of the human brain. I'm sure you know that. And they are what enable one part of the brain to connect to the other part. So they're like the cellular waves that we are in frequencies that we're all using now to hear each other and to be able to communicate with each other at long distances. In the brain, those fiber tracks are formed by axons. And axons, you remember, deliver information or send information, and they're wrapped in myelin. The thicker the myelin, the more efficient the fiber track. So you can think of axons as being the wires that connect these areas together in the brain and that they become insulated, just like wires that are connecting my computer to get electricity right now, and that insulation is myelin. The myelin, the thicker it is, the more efficient the system. Just like the thicker the insulation around my wires of electricity, the more likely that they will be efficient and I won't have shorts. Now, the thickness of myelin builds over time, and it builds with experience as well. So when we are going through different kinds of experiences, 
whether it's in school or whether it's social experiences, we are building fiber tracks and we're building them in terms of the efficiency of how well they conduct information. And that continues for many years. In addition, in this particular slide, you can see three neurons. You see two axonal fiber tracks, but actually three of the neuronal cells. And in addition to axons, they also have dendrites, which you know well. And dendrites receive information. Dendrites are like fingers that project out from the cell body of the neuron in the brain, and they are growing throughout your life. So when you learn something new, you get new dendrites, and those dendrites will make new connections. And then when you use that information and apply that information, that information is sent over the axonal fiber tracks, and the axonal fiber tracks become more efficient at sending the information. Now, I said at the very beginning of the course that these fiber tracks mature over time. And we couldn't really see the fiber tracks until very recently. LaBelle, who was at University of Montreal, in 2008 published one of the first papers actually using a technology we call diffusion tensor imaging, where we can see myelinated fiber tracks. And what you'll see here is there's a big blue fiber track in the side of the brain, both on the left and the right. That has a long name, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, but that's just Latin for top long fiber track. And that big blue fiber track is being built during school years. And it's very important in the left hemisphere for language and for reading and for mathematics. And in the right hemisphere, that very fiber track is very important for social skill learning and for something we call theory of mind, which is the ability to take the perspective of other people. So these two fiber tracks are going to be central to many aspects of communication linguistic communication in the left hemisphere and reading, and social communication in the right hemisphere. It's essential that those fiber tracks develop adequately. Now, those fiber tracks mature at different rates. So that fiber track I just told you about, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, the blue one that you saw, is actually on this slide. It's small and probably a little difficult for you to see, but it's the second graph up on the right-hand side from the bottom. And what you're looking at on the horizontal axis of this graph is age, from five years of age until 30 years of age. And what you're looking at on the left side of the graph is how thick the myelin is, generally speaking, called fractional anisotropy, a big word, but essentially we're looking at how thick the fiber track is. And you can see that that particular fiber track is maturing from five years of age to about 19 to 20 years of age. Now, that corresponds with the time students are in school. So I often say that's the fiber track teachers build because it's language and reading and math in the left hemisphere. And then the experiences that students have socially during the school years build the right hemisphere fiber tracks. Now, there are other big, long fiber tracks. You can see there's a big, long red one called the inferior fronto occipital fiber track, a big, long red fiber track that runs from the occipital lobe all the way to the frontal lobe. It also is maturing, but it finishes maturation just a little bit earlier, it looks like, at least from LaBelle's research, than the superior longitudinal. And then in the top view, you see a, a relatively long fiber track at the very bottom that's purple. And that is the third one up on the right. That's the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, or bottom long fiber track. And that develops very early and is almost totally mature by the time your students are seven or eight years of age. That's very important for fine motor coordination. So being able to hold a pen or a pencil and being able to start to draw and things like that are going to be important for that particular fiber track. But what's important for our understanding of autism spectrum disorders is we now know that these that autism spectrum disorders are disorders of these fiber tracks. The fiber tracks just don't mature in children on the autism spectrum the way they do in children who are typically learning. And so since fiber tracks are experience dependent, the good news is that teachers and educators can build those fiber tracks 
and so can we build the fiber tracks with interventions. But because the fiber tracks seem to be maturing more slowly, we're going to have to really target our interventions to build those fiber tracks specifically. And children on the autism spectrum are probably going to need a lot more experience with these particular kinds of activities than typically developing children. Now, why would it be that the fiber tracks don't mature as quickly in children on the spectrum as they do in children who are typical learners? We now know that that's probably due to genetic mutations. They're called de novo mutations. De novo, is you see at the top of this slide, just means newly born, that's what it means. So they're new mutations. They aren't inherited. The child isn't getting a gene from a father or a mother necessarily, but they're having, they're getting changes in their genes. We don't know exactly why. And the more, the more of these de novo mutations a child has, the more likely they will become autistic. And what many of these mutations do is affect the development of the brain and the fiber tracts. So we're now starting to understand why autism exists and how it's manifested. And so, as I said, what these genetic mutations do, we know from research by Wolf, for example, using, again, DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, just like LaBelle did, we can look at the fiber tract development in young children. We can follow them. We can look at them before they present with symptoms of autism, and we can follow them, that's what Wolf did, until their diagnosis. So they can be followed longitudinally. And what Wolf found is that what you see is the fiber tracts, these axonal fiber tracts in here, you're looking at three of the most important ones that we just talked about a few minutes ago, the superior longitudinal fasciculus on the top, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus at the bottom. These major fiber tracts, are not maturing in the same way they are in typical children. They actually start out thicker in children on the autism spectrum when they're babies, when they're just a few months old, but their lines over on the graphs on the right are the red lines. And what you can see is their fiber track lines are relatively flat compared to the blue lines which are typically developing children, children that don't have a history of any autism spectrum in their family or aren't at risk for autism spectrum. And if we follow them over time, the blue lines are getting higher, meaning they're getting thick, the myelin's getting thicker. But in the children on the autism spectrum, you can see especially the one that you see the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, that second fiber tract, it flattens out. So. The genes then are affecting the way these fiber tracts mature. What Wolf concluded then is that the core behaviors that we see in autism spectrum are due to these atypical patterns of connectivity. The patterns differ across systems and time. So some of them are atypical when they're babies. Some of them are atypically developing when they're a little bit older. They're not specific to one region or to one kind of behavior, and they are resulting in other problems as the students get older. So Tang, for example, and his colleagues in 2014 did research that showed that when these fiber tracts don't mature, the effect it has is the dendrites then don't get pruned. And dendrites, remember, are the fingers that reach out from the cell body of neurons. And one of the characteristics of those fingers is you learn new information, you get new dendritic spines. But when you go to sleep, the information that you learn today that isn't relevant to you or important to you, details that don't really matter, like maybe the color of shoes someone wore on the bus next to you on the way to work, those dendrites will become pruned away. And it looks like in children on the autism spectrum, that isn't happening. So another problem that occurs in addition to the fiber tracks is new information isn't called and it isn't prioritized. So their brains are full of lots of information, but it isn't prioritized. So that's kind of the neuroscience of autism. Let's talk about how we can identify these children early because the earlier we can identify them, the earlier we can start interventions 
that are going to create a more normal maturational experience. So just a few years ago, Karen Pierce, based on research that had been accumulating for about the past 10 years, came up with a five-minute checklist that pediatricians can use. She published it in the Journal of Pediatrics in 2011. It's based on data on a little over 10,000 babies that were screened at their one-year checkup, and it has 24 questions that physicians can ask of the parents during the one-year checkup, and it accurately predicted autism spectrum disorder risk in about 75% of the children. There were a few false alarms, so Karen Pierce's checklist might raise an alarm in a family where the child doesn't eventually end up with autism spectrum. But the fact that you can identify so many children in a year gives us the opportunity to get into those little brains earlier, to intervene with those children earlier, and to have a greater impact on maturation since so much of maturation is occurring from birth all the way through 30 years of age. The earlier we can get into an experience-dependent brain, the better the outcome we can have. Some of the main components of her checklist are uh, that distinguish children on the spectrum at a year from children who eventually do not present with autism spectrum disorders is lack of shared attention. So the baby should try to pull parents or other adults into their world. If they don't do that, then that's a risk factor. Lack of shared enjoyment. The baby may smile at mother, but it may not smile at other people. And if it doesn't, then that is a second risk factor that repetitive behaviors are already starting to form, like the baby may at a year take a car and instead of moving the car around on the floor and pretending that they're driving it and going boom, they might just sit and spin the wheel over and over and over again. And then any language problems that present themselves with the above behaviors are risk. Now, some new research just published a couple of months ago by Rogers, a pilot study that was done at University of California. They took infants that were at risk for autism spectrum disorder. They began treatment in the first year of life, so they had a 12-week intense parental intervention where they taught parents how to talk to the children, how to play with the children, how to interact with the children, and they had some match control groups of children who were not on the autism spectrum or some who were, and they found that when they looked at those children at 18 months and 36 months, and remember they started this intervention with the parents doing the work, really, being taught how to work with the children at about 12 months of age, that they were less symptomatic, both at 18 months and 36 months. And at 36 months, the treated group had much lower rates of autism spectrum disorders diagnosed, and their developmental quotients, their IQs, were higher. So it looks like the earlier we can intervene with students, the better, and that teaching parents how to communicate with their children, how to play with their children, is a very good start for intervening. Now, the best news, as I said earlier, is that because autism spectrum disorders affect white matter development, our educational interventions, our speech, language, occupational therapy, and social interventions are going to drive neuroplastic changes in white matter. And so education and intervention work. Now, what are the neurological factors that would lead children to those first symptoms, which is the inability to have shared attention and perhaps even to get enjoyment from others. Let's look at our understanding of attentional problems and let's look at how that might affect our students, especially as they get into the adolescent years. Attention matures just like everything else matures cognitively. So your memory skills mature, your language skills mature, your social skills mature, and your attention matures. And attention maturation allows for changing from being attentive to the whole world around you all at the same time, we call that global attention, to being able to focus on one thing in your environment and ignore everything else. 
So attention moves from being global to focus. And ch young children have very broad-based or global attention. They're, they're looking around all the time. They're excited by what's going on about them. But we want them to develop focused attention. There's an excellent article in the Scientific American Mind that came out a few years ago on how if attentional problems persist as global, that is, if a person, as they get older, can't focus on one set of, of stimuli and ignore everything else going on around them, then that is going to be exhibited later in life as problems with self-control or what we call cognitive control. That these are very related functions of self-regulation. And we know children on the autism spectrum have a lot of problems with self-regulation. Now, the new view of self-control or self-regulation is that there are two systems. It's a dual system model. We have a low level of self-control that is associated with very deep regions in our brain called our limbic system, kind of our emotional center, if you will. And those regions are involved in reward processing. So when I get rewarded for doing something, it makes me excited and I want to do it again and again and again. Now, that reward center is, is associated with uh, drug abuse. So if you have someone who is alcohol dependent or drug dependent, then that particular control center is going to become overly activated through the use of drugs, and then drugs become a dependent part of a person's life. They utilize the drugs to maintain that control. Now, what happens to those of us for whom self-control matures, and we are fortunate enough not to become dependent on, on drugs, for example, is that we use our own experience for reward, and we use planning and goal setting for rewards. So one of the things all of you are doing right now is you're attending a course and you're doing it for the long-range goal of learning more about your students and being better at what you do. Now that involves your prefrontal cortex, those kind of beige areas we talked about at the very beginning of the course. And that's, that specific part of the prefrontal cortex matures over time so that we become better and better and better able to set our own rewards, to put them into the future so we can have long-term goals that we don't expect a reward to be immediate, whereas those lower centers are going to be much more vulnerable to a desire for immediate control. Now, this is the part of the lower part of the brain, this dual system model of self-control, this internal very deep structure called the limbic system that's very important for that low level. And then the prefrontal cortex is going to override that and enable you to be goal-oriented and to plan ahead and to be able to resist the impulse to get a reward every time you do something. So we have this dual system of self-control with a high level, which is the prefrontal cortex, colored beige in that first picture we saw. You can see it here. It's colored black. And then the internal structures that are more primitive older and develop earlier in a child that, are, that depend more on immediate gratification. And one thing you can see from this slide of God taste that was published in 2004 that shows the developmental trajectory of different parts of the brain, that red line that you see that has the little triangles on it is the prefrontal cortex. And what you can see is some parts of the brain, like the parts of the brain that learn language, which you see in the green and the blue dots that at age five are fairly high up and then starting to be pruned, that those parts of the brain get actually thinner over time because you're pruning dendrites away that you don't need. I don't need dendrites in my language area for Japanese. I don't need dendrites in my language area for learning how to play a violin. By the time I'm 17 or 18, if I never was interested in a violin, those connections, those dendrites will actually be pruned. But you can see that that red line, the frontal lobe, is continuing to build itself into the school years 
from five years of age up to 10 or 11 years of age, some pruning does occur during adolescence of the prefrontal cortex, and then it takes off again. So that those of us who are older than 20, and presumably most of us are, we have frontal lobes that have continued to mature. They'll continue to mature into our 30s that allow us to be better and better at goal setting and planning and being organized and have better self-control. What happens in autism spectrum is that curve can be changed. It can be flattened or it can be altered in the direction where the maturation and pruning is occurring at later ages. And that gives us more of an opportunity to work with our students, which is really what I want to get to the guts at um, in our discussion today. So when we talk about self-control then, self-regulation, or what's often called cognitive control, it includes this ability to have focused attention for long periods of time. We call that selective and sustained attention the capacity for holding information in mind and keeping it there over hours, sometimes days, so we can do something like read a textbook and remember everything we've read, um, maybe the next day or two days later, self-regulation, and then goal setting. Working memory, we go beyond attention in this cognitive control network, working memory has to do with this ability to hold information in mind. It's also a frontal lobe function. It's also part of this executive system. I like to think of it as your RAM, your read-only memory, and it is available to you for learning. We know from research by Suzanne Jaggi that was published in 2008 that when adults who we thought this frontal lobe was all formed, when we exercise just working memory with adults, and that's the graph on your left, you see a black dot and a white dot on top of each other on the left-hand graph, and that underneath it says pre, that's before they went through working memory training, and then the post dots you can see are very separate. The black dot is the experimental group, the white dot is a control group that just played video games, while the experimental group was doing working memory exercises. They only did them for 19 days, you can see that over on the right, but it's improved not just their working memory, but what we call their fluid intelligence, their ability to solve problems you've never seen before, another executive function skill, problem solving. So by exercising working memory, we can drive this frontal lobe to mature. Now, our students that have working memory problems, the way it looks to us when we work with them is they take tests very slowly because they have to keep reading the questions and the answer because they can't hold it in their mind easily. They probably reread passages over and over again because they can't remember what they just read. Often these are students who have trouble memorizing formulas in mathematics or memorizing even their computational tables when they're younger, memorizing the alphabet. And they take longer to complete homework. They often have word-finding problems, and in English, they may have spelling problems because spelling in English is very irregular. So working memory problems, whether a child's on the spectrum or not, can really interfere with learning in school, and it can interfere with developing these other cognitive control mechanisms. So if we have students with attentional problems versus memory problems, the attentional problems or the child with auditory processing problems tunes out a lot. And we know children on the spectrum often tune out. They may frequently ask us to repeat ourselves. That's often a sign of a working memory problem. They may be sitting in a classroom looking at what everybody else is doing because they can't follow what the teacher is talking about and they stop paying attention to the teacher. That can be working memory, it can be auditory processing, and then if they're fidgety and hyperactive, that's a sign, of course, of ADHD. So the issues that affect the older student then are going to affect the development of this prefrontal cortex. And it's going to affect their social abilities, their abilities to relate to other people, and their ability to set goals and to be flexible. That's all what the frontal lobe is about. A lot of research on the adolescent brain. I'm not going to spend too much time with it. Certainly, you're able to look it up yourself. Crone and Dahl have written a wonderful article that's in your bibliography on understanding the adolescent brain and how during adolescence, 
the the social and affective influences can drive the brain to be more immature in many respects. And the adolescent in general is going to be more impulsive. They're going to have a preference for decisions that provide immediate rewards over long-term rewards. They're going to have trouble learning and predicting from the errors. They're going to be much more emotional, and their emotions are going to impact their decisions. And then social influences are, are going to impact their decision making. And what happens with autism spectrum disorders is that is exacerbated because their brain is even maturing more slowly. So what you really care about is what can be done about all of this. What as educators can we do? And, and so what I really want to focus on is classroom activities and intervention tools that we have available for middle and high school students to help them with some of these executive function capacities. First, A number one is cognitive control. One of the things we've learned, because the brain is plastic, because it is experience dependent, we can teach goal setting. And we can teach students how to set and delay their goals and their rewards. Now, one way that you all use all the time if you work with middle or high school students is having an assignment, a project of some kind, with a due date. But what will happen with our students on the autism spectrum or any of our students who have problems with cognitive control very frequently is that they'll wait till the last minute. We've all been there. So they wait till the night before or the day before the project's due. They announce to their parents that the project is due. And often the parent is up till midnight trying to help them get the project done. So one way that you can build cognitive control in students through experience is rather than just assigning a due date, try to give the students incentives for steps achieved prior to the due date. So if the project is due on June 21st, let's say, maybe they can have extra points toward their grade or toward the project outcome if they hand in an outline of what they're going to do by May 15th or if they have parts of the project that they submit by May 25th. By actually taking large projects and building interim goals, you're teaching students how to plan. You can have sign-up sheets, which sometimes works, where the students sign up for a due date as opposed to you providing the due date. Now, you're going to have to have specific guidelines for that. And those who sign up for earlier due dates could get more points for their project. You can also phrase goals in terms of the advantages. One of the things we have a tendency sometimes to do in school is to have penalties. So penalties if a student hands in a paper late or a lower grade, or an incomplete, or some other way that they're punished if they hand something in late. By putting the advantages in terms of incentives for getting it in earlier or getting parts of it in earlier, like let's say a group pizza party if everybody gets a part of their project in on time, we now know from neuroscience research that that's a much more effective way of driving these pathways because they're reward-based. Punishment can actually retard maturation of the brain, whereas reward can actually build it if it's carefully designed. You don't want to reward something that isn't deserving of reward because that would create a permanent behavior you don't want. Some other takeaways from research, there's a wonderful article in your bibliography by Blake Moore and Robbins, as well as the Cronin and Dahl article. When teaching adolescents, because they're impulsive and emotional, reward patience. So don't necessarily reward the best book report only. Reward the students who were patient and worked toward their book report and didn't panic when the due date came and worked systematically toward it. Keep in mind that the adolescent brain is over-responsive to peer influence. So be careful of how you group students together when you're having them work with each other. And help them to be flexible in setting their goals. They're going to want to change their goals based on their peers. And what you want them to do is change goals based on other incentives, like future things that they may want to accomplish. And I'll show you how you can do that. And be careful about praise, because in a classroom, for example, the teacher's pet is not always the most popular student. And sometimes praise has a negative or social cost to students. 
Now, there's a wonderful four-quadrant model of facilitated learning I want to draw your attention to. It's published in the Australian Occupational Therapy Journal, and you might think that would be impossible for you to get, but actually you can get it at Google Scholar. And what this article does is it shows you how you as a therapist or teacher can initiate kinds of behaviors that are going to be good for goal setting and self-control and decision making, and then how eventually you can turn that over to the learner taking responsibility. So let's just take a real quick example of this. When we're first working with students, let's say we want them to write a book report, we will have explicit instruction. That's in the upper left-hand corner. We initiate that as a teacher or a therapist. Explicit instruction, I want it to be this long. I want you to have a paragraph on plot. I want you to have a paragraph on characters. I want you to have a paragraph on timeline. So we have very explicit instruction. We demonstrate it. We might give them examples, and we might ask low-order questions. Is this the right timeline? Are you sure of it? Where did you find it? Are these all the characters? Were there any other characters? So we guide that part of it. Now, that's our direct instruction. Our indirect instruction, we want them to start making some decisions, so we might ask higher order questions like, if you wanted to review this and check for the characters, what are some ways you could do that? Or if you're looking at your science text and you're answering questions at the end of the chapter and you're not sure if some of the answers are correct, where might you find where those answers would be? How might you check your work? Those are higher order questions. You're asking the student to take more responsibility for looking up their errors. And you try to get them to start thinking out loud about how they can do better on a task. Now, those are all what I'm going to call teacher-initiated. Our goal, ultimately, with adolescents is to get, in Common Core emphasizes a lot of this, to get their ability to do these kinds of things to be initiated by themselves. So some direct methods for building up competence, let's say, with studying for a test might be teaching them what we call mnemonic strategies, ways to remember all the dates that they have to remember for a history test or ways to remember the characters' names in a book that they just read. The mnemonic strategies might be first sounds of the characters' names, first letters. It might be with dates. It might be a timeline that they make where they actually put the timeline on a piece of paper and they put the historical dates on the timeline themselves. They might have ways that they cue themselves to remember. So they might have a letter for each finger of their hand that is one of the characters in a book and they use those kind of cues to help them. So those would be learner-initiated approaches to doing better on assignments or tests. And then finally, we want the students to reach autonomy. We want them to be able to do all this themselves. So we want them to start questioning themselves. We want them to start trying new strategies and, and experimenting with them themselves. We want them to do problem solving. Um, and that's where we're going to go, this indirect autonomous adult who is going to be a problem solver and going to be someone who can learn more on their own without being so directly guided by teachers. And so these are the learner strategies I just went through. Framing, which is figuring out, prioritizing the most important key points of something for a test or something to include on a report. Mnemonic devices, memory devices for memorizing things. Verbal self-instruction, where if you have a child who is on the autism spectrum, this might be hard, especially if they have language problems, but first I'm going to do this. First I'm going to make an outline. Then I'm going to fill in the outline with some basic facts. Then I'm going to write eat one paragraph for each basic part of the outline. That would be verbal self-instruction. Visual cues might be any kind of graphic organizers or any any ways they use to remember things. And self-prompting is just ways they can kind of help themselves to get access to information again. Keep in mind, adolescents are risk takers. And for students on the autism spectrum, social skills require them to take the perspective of others, to be flexible, and to have some emotional control. And those are all issues for students on the autism spectrum that persist through adolescence. One of the things we want to do is activities that help them take the perspective of others. 
We want to build in activities for these students that allow them to be flexible and change their goal based on maybe what someone else needs or wants or based on changes that occur in the school calendar. Right now, a lot of people across the country are experiencing a lot of snow days, and we've learned or have experienced snow days, and we've learned that we have to be flexible and the students have to be flexible about when assignments are due. So that can be one example of how you can help students think out. Now, if you're not even in school on the day when your book report was due, what does that mean? What does that mean about how you could change that goal? And what might you want to ask the teacher about to be able to change that particular due date? And then emotional control is just something that we're going to have to work with these students to develop to rise above their limbic system, if you will, and their impulsivity. And we do that with very strategic rewards. In middle school, one of the ways we can really help students, especially with emotional control, is routine. The students on the spectrum, we all know this, are students who become really outdone and confused and frustrated when their routines change. Now, you are the, you as the teacher or you as the therapist are the student's frontal lobes. You are the ones who are going to be regulating them in middle school and to a certain extent into high school. And the more severe the autism spectrum symptoms are, the more you're going to act in that role. But when students know what to expect, they can focus on learning. And so we want to establish routines to aid their expectations, and we want to make that a part of their day in every single classroom they're in, whether it's a mainstream classroom or a resource classroom. So just standing at the door and directing students when they enter the classroom to get started to take out their materials that they're going to be working on that day, maybe have a little routine activity that they always do at the beginning of class, maybe another five-minute routine activity they always do at the end of class, helps bridge this emotional impulsivity of adolescence and pre-adolescence and gives them the security of knowing what to expect and how to get there. So you can establish beginning of the class routines. You can establish end of the class routines. Sometimes you'll just say to the students, watch the clock because the last five minutes we're going to be closing together. So you're going to close your book and we're going to be summarizing what we did today. And if you do that routinely, the students learn to anticipate that and get comfort from that. And it helps them to transition. Now let's talk about activities you can include in your classroom that will help build selective attention, for example. One thing you can do is have students during, let's say, a student's book report, during an early part of a classroom activity, listen for details. So how many times when I was reviewing for you the book that we're going to be reading in class, how many times did I use the word straw hat? Okay? And if the book is about somebody's wardrobe and straw hat comes up a few times, you might have used it five or six times. So you're getting them to pay attention not just to the content of what you're saying, but to other details. That's an activity that can build selective attention. Where's Waldo type of visual search activities are wonderful for children on the spectrum because that really helps with visual selective attention. And you can have prizes that students get when they listen carefully for certain facts or information that is presented during the day. You can also have listening activities. One thing I love to do with children, older children on the autism spectrum, is audiobooks. Because audiobooks are books that they have to listen to, they have to pay attention. If you've ever tried to listen to an audiobook when you're driving a car and you realize that you spent the last 15 minutes not paying any attention and then you try to rewind either the tape or go back on the DVD and figure out where you left off, that's how demanding audiobooks are, and those are wonderful activities for children on the spectrum because you can have them listen for a short period of time, 15 minutes, then maybe in a month, 20 minutes at a time, then maybe in a month, 25. You can have 10 or 11 questions that you ask them, and they have to listen for those questions. It's one way to build up auditory attending skills. Also, having them follow complex directions is helpful. Working memory training, we know, not only improves problem solving in adults, but Susie and Jaggi did a follow-up study with some colleagues in 2012 with seven-year-old students and showed that if you just do working memory training for 15 minutes a day in every classroom where students just have to remember facts or details, 
what will happen is that their reading comprehension will improve significantly over students who don't do working memory activities. So working memory activities are a way to build the frontal lobe and a way to start getting these executive functions maturing. Now, many of your students on the autism spectrum are going to need much more help and more specific kinds of interventions, and I want to talk about that. And we're going to have a few that we cover over the next 8 to 10 minutes. And first of all, planners. Remember that part of what your frontal lobe, your prefrontal lobe is doing for self-control and self-regulation is planning ahead. Well, one way you can plan ahead is with your own planner. I use Outlook, some people have other calendars that they use, Google calendars, but we're going to talk about using planners with children to help them build this capacity to plan ahead, to be organized, to be goal goal oriented. You can have materials that you help the students organize, like their trapper keeper or their locker. You can have them use Google Docs or email themselves or text themselves to remind themselves of things that they need to do. And we'll talk about tigers, which is taking control of responsibility for getting things done and how you can do that with students who have greater disabilities. I'm also going to talk about the advantage of doing warm-ups for reading and writing and math, that before you have a major assignment with a child on the autism spectrum, have five minutes where they get to do something relatively easy. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what I call $10 words or $10 items, which help them prioritize and figure out what are the most important things that they've learned today or what are the most important things they got out of this particular homework assignment. So with planners, you're going to have entries for every class. And if there isn't something that's due, then you're going to just put nothing in there or write the word none. You can put long-term projects on the planners. I like to have a 1 to 10 confidence scale where the student lets me know how confident they are of how well they either have prepared the project or how confident they are that they're going to do well on a test that they have. 10 would be, yes, I'm going to do very well on the test. 1 would be, I don't understand the material at all. And then starting to take the initiative to talk to teachers about have I gotten everything done? Is there anything else I have to do? So this is what a student planner looks like that I use. You can see there's an entry for every class, every content class that this student has, and then the days of the week. And what you want to do is have the timelines available. So I want the planner to be clear enough that they can see everything. And I want them to be able to quickly see when something is due. So what I do with the planner is I have the students write any project that's due, turn the paper over, and write it on its side. So in English, you can see they have a graphic due for a book report on Thursday, and that has been circled and written on its side. And they have a test in math on Friday. Now, if they have a test in math on Friday, I'm going to want a confidence interval of a number. And you can see that on Tuesday, this particular student said put a five with a circle around it, meaning they felt like they could probably get about half the items on the math test right. But they've also included on their student planner a note that they have to study for the test on Wednesday and Thursday. And they'll put another confidence interval in for Wednesday and Thursday after they study. Anytime they get something done, they can check it off. So you can see in social studies, they had an article to read on Monday, and they were supposed to write a response in their journal to that article on Tuesday. That student had checked that off, so that means it's complete. And then the student has on Thursday a, the notation Thursday note. They also have on Wednesday that it's grandma's birthday to help them remember, so anything can go in the bottom that's coming up. But Thursday note means that they give a note to their teacher saying, do I have all my assignments in? And they're going to do that in every class they're in. And then that gives them one day for the teacher to say, no, you know, you missed your, your math homework. It was due Tuesday, and gives them a chance to do it. And it's also teaching them to take initiative to get things done. Now, TIGERS is take initiative, get everything ready for school. And it is for cognitive control, for self-control. And it's something they do the night before they go to school. When they finish their homework, they will have either a special homework folder or a place where they put all of their work. And so everything is, I usually have my older students on the spectrum have a spot right next to the door 
where they go out either to the garage to get in the car when they're going to be going to school or where they can go outside, and they put all of their homework in their Trapper Keeper right next to the door so that it's ready to go before they turn in for bed at night. And their Trapper Keeper is going to have a special folder for each subject area and a place for all their homework. So they can check to make sure that each folder has something in it. They can look back at their planner, because if a folder doesn't have something in it, make sure they didn't have an assignment that was due, and then everything's ready the next day. That kind of preparation for the next day is something I even do now, so that I'm fully prepared every night for everything that has to be done the next day, and it's all laid out. So I'm not waking up in the middle of the night thinking to myself, oh, I forgot to do this, I forgot to do that. So something we can all do. Now, some things you can do to help our students on the spectrum with reading are warm-ups. Before they read a passage that's important for school or homework, just five minutes of reading something that's fun for them to read. It can be a comic book. It can be Harry Potter that they've read 300 times, and they're just going to read for five minutes from that. I want them to also highlight important words in the book. And if they are getting the book out of the library and they can't use a highlighter, they can make a list of those words. They can make a list of $10 stories in a book that's an anthology or $10 words in their assignments. So it's a way of having them prioritize what's really important. And at the end of each week, we count up how many $10 words they have or $10 assignments or whatever, and they get little tokens from me that have a 10 on them. And at the end of a month, they may use those tokens to buy a pizza party or they may use those to tokens to do something fun with their parents, like go to Great America or something. Now keep in mind there are technological alternatives for students that also work on executive functions, that work on working memory, that work on attentional skills. Cogmed has been found to be very effective. Fast Forward is found to be very effective. And for adults, there's a program called Brain HQ. We also, though, want to work on literacy and writing skills with the older students. Writing can be very difficult for children with language problems, for students with language problems, for students on the autism spectrum. So we can have interventions specifically for writing. Again, a five or seven minute warm up of writing where they just write as fast as they can anything that comes to their mind. They can describe their dog. They can describe a kitten. They can just write words that they think are funny words. I also have them work on checking their work. I call that COPS. Seven-minute writing is something easy and fun. They double-space it to remind them that all drafts have room for improvement. And I call it talking on paper. They can write anything they want, and at the end, we're going to count the number of words. COPS stands for capitalization, overall sound, punctuation, and spelling. And this is where I want the students to be able to go back and first check for the C, capitalization, do all their sentences, start with a capital. Second, read what they read out loud. Does it sound right? Does it sound like what they want it to sound like? If they've read it all aloud and they like the way it sounds, then have them go back and do the P, which is punctuation. Make sure they have periods at the end of sentences and commas where they're supposed to be, apostrophes if they've learned how to use those. And then they check for spelling. And sometimes checking for spelling means using their computer and spell track or an iPhone or an iPad. I do a lot with graphic organizers, probably a lot of you do too, to help students with, on the spectrum to visualize what is helpful for them before they write a report. They're very helpful with writing projects. This is a middle school example of a graphic organizer for Charlotte's Web. It includes the characters. It includes a little bit of the timeline. For emotional regulation, there are some wonderful forms you can get from guilford.com. They fill them out themselves. It helps them to think about their fear of social rejection, their need to look cool. Parents can fill them out. Students can. And it will give you a feeling for where your student might need some help with emotional regulation. Children with ASD, especially children with Asperger's, may appear to underreact or overreact to some situations. So we work hard with putting things in perspective, making a hierarchy of their problems, discussing the severity of their problems, discussing how to express their opinions in ways that are kind or careful about other people's views. I might even work with my older students on self-knowledge. Who am I? What are their opinions? What are their beliefs? What are their desires? 
And then once they've thought about who they are, think about, okay, who is Billy? What do I think his beliefs are? What do I think his desires are? I really like this Harry Potter. Does he like Harry Potter? Does he like to think about it? It helps with building perspective. Emotional awareness can be built through emotional vocabulary. How do you feel today? What are your feelings? What are other people's feelings? Looking at photographs of emotional faces, talking about their feelings, and just talking about how you express your feelings. What do you do when you're angry? What are ways that you can express anger? You can even work on problem solving with emotional vocabulary. When I'm angry, what are some things I can do? I can ask for help. I can take a break. I can go for a walk. That won't bother anybody. If I scream or if I hit someone, I could hurt them. I like to work on person perception, just thinking about other people, observing the behavior of other people, observing how other people's behaviors can hurt your feelings. Therefore, your behavior can hurt other people's feelings as well. Practice drawing inferences about how other people feel based on what you see and what you know about them. You may have to, with children on the autism spectrum, spend some time on nonverbal cues. How can I tell when someone else is angry? Some people are pretty good at hiding their anger. How can I tell when someone is disappointed in me or frustrated? What are the signs on their faces? There is a program out there that works on this that's specifically designed for it by Simon Baron Cohen, and it's called Mind Reading, and it has facial expressions and voices and activities students can do to express emotions or talk about them. Michelle Garcia Winner had some marvelous taking perspective kinds of materials, posters and workbooks and games students can play. To work on theory of mind, one of the things we want to do is actually practice thinking about other people, what they think, what they need, and forming hypotheses about other people, about what they might want or how they might feel, and then playing games where one person doesn't know something the other person does. Sometimes those are called barrier games. And getting this, the child on the autism spectrum to realize that you don't always know what the other person knows, but you can guess and you can figure it out by asking questions. Now, finally, I want to finish with goal setting. Very important for executive function skills, especially in high school, to be able to set goals, long-term goals. And to do that for our students, we need to break the goals down into workable segments. And so I love this backwards goal design I'm going to show you now. This is actually something I did with one of my own students. This is a student who is in high school, and his long-term goal, you can see at the very top, his big dream is he wants to be a high school coach. So we started with the fact that he's a good athlete, by the way. He's a very good basketball player, and his goal in life is to be a high school coach. So working backwards, what is one thing he has to have to be a high school coach? He's got to have a college degree. So he's going to have to be able to get to college and finish four years of college if he wants to be a high school coach. So let's backtrack now to high school. What is he going to have to do in high school to be able to get into college? Well, he's going to have to have good enough grades in high school that they'll accept him in a college, and he's going to have to do well on standardized tests like the SAT or the ACT, and he's going to have to complete a college application. Now, this particular student I was working with is a sophomore, so he's not quite there yet. And what did he have to do this particular semester? Well, this particular semester of high school, he's going to have to get a B in science and social studies at least, and probably an A in physical education, probably an A in mathematics, because if he wants to get in college and to become a high school coach, he's going to have to show he's a very good athlete. He's also going to have to show he has some good skills, mathematical skills, to be able to get through college. So this week, what does he have to do? We're going to go to his planner, and he's going to have to really concentrate on his social studies test and get an A or a B on it. And what does that mean he's going to do today? It means today he's going to have to study for a half an hour for social studies. So using this kind of a model really helps the students to be able to Set goals and think about long-term planning. I made this a very lofty goal, but it could be a goal for just winning a football game, or it could be a goal for just making it to sophomore in high school. I have a little girl that I'm working with who is now in the fifth grade. She's going to be going to middle school next year, and 
we are thinking about goals for her for next year and helping her to work towards those goals just for next year because she wants to be popular when she goes to middle school. So those are the kinds of things you can build with a goal setting. So in conclusion, I just want to highlight a few points that we've covered in the talk. First, early and purposeful intervention we now know can really enhance brain development and create a more typical brain. We know from brain research that the behavioral manifestations of both attentional disorders and autism spectrum disorders are associated with atypical brain function as well as delayed brain maturation. But the great news is that early intervention has a positive impact and it improves outcome. And the other good news is that therapists and teachers change brains. So key functional brain structures are continuing to mature well into the 20s, and we can have a tremendous impact on that. Secondly, I want to emphasize that consistent collaboration is essential. These students of ours are students who have struggled for many years. They're in their teens. And so we need parents and teachers and therapists all working together with consistent goals and methodology. Third, I want to emphasize the importance of reward. Reward is the main way that dopamine is released in the brain. Dopamine is what saves brain structures and keeps information current and enables the brain to organize itself in a positive way. So using reward rather than punishment is just a much better way to change behavior, especially in adolescents. Then finally, I want to emphasize that there are many wonderful free resources out there for you. You can also see two great books on executive functions for adolescents. One is by Richard Blair. The title of it is Smart But Scattered Teens, the Executive Skills Program for Helping Teens Reach Their Potential. And the other one is a book by Joyce Cooper Kahn and Margaret Foster entitled Boosting Executive Skills in the Classroom, a Practical Guide for Educators. So I'm glad that you all participated in the webinar. Thank you to Presence Learning for their ongoing support of the SPED Ahead series. And now I think it's time to take questions from the audience. So Clay, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Marty. You really struck a nerve with this talk. You had over 4,500 people signed up, which I think is a testament to the interest in this topic, uh, as well as the practical tips that you've outlaid here and just how helpful they are to everyone in working with their children and their students. So as you can imagine, with 4,500 participants here today, we have gotten a ton of questions, so let's just dig right in. Here's the first one. Are we setting up children for failure by pushing medications on them while they are young, as opposed to teaching them strategies to cope with attention that will carry over into adulthood? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, there's quite a bit of research on medication right now that shows that um, the earlier multi-setting um, trials that were done, there were there's 15 years ago, 10 years ago, showed that um, Medications are most effective when students also get behavioral strategies and when they're given behavioral strategies. So we know that medication by itself from the several studies done through the American Psychiatric Association and American Pediatric Association is not enough for attention. So this is an excellent question. And keep in mind there is now a lot of cognitive technology out there. I mentioned some of it in the talk. Cogmed, for example, has been shown to be very effective with ADHD. Nice research study out of the research labs at Oregon, independent study on fast forward showing it's effective with attention. So we have other options for students um, in addition to medication. We also know from a a study that was done just about six or seven years ago that generally speaking medication is most effective for about 14 months because then the brain adapts. So it is important that we include these other cognitive interventions. It's important that we help the students develop strategies and that is what's going to carry them through in the long run. So thank you for that question. Very, very good question. So what does the research reveal regarding a lecture with visual presentation materials versus a lecture with no visuals? 
And then there's a follow-up here, but I'll let you answer that one first. All right. All there right. really isn't a lot of good research on presentation modes. Um, you know, we have whiteboards now. We have electronic boards now. We have all sorts of devices that we can use in the classroom. And I'm sorry to say that even though they're quite trendy, we don't have good controlled research um, helping us understand how visuals help. We know that in general visuals help, but um, what the research really shows, the neuroscience research shows, is it's the methods the teachers use or the methods that are built into, let's say, cognitive interventions that are most effective. And those, me those methods include how the teacher gets the child's attention and, and, can, and keeps the child's attention, um, how the teacher reinforces the students individually, how the student, how the teacher uses novelty. Um, sometimes visuals can be novel and create some novelty, but it is those combinations that are most effective for students in terms of them changing their brain. So the research right now is on methodology, not on visuals, for example. Great. So here's the follow-up. Does listening to music or physical activity while working independently help students regulate their behavior? Again, we don't have any good research on that. Um, we have an old study that was done, you probably heard of the Mozart effect, where uh, older students actually listened to Mozart after they worked on activities and the listening to Mozart did seem to help. We have some nice research out of Northwestern. My colleague Nina Krause has done some outstanding research on the value of musical training for students in improving cognitive skills. But as far as listening to music while working, my general advice would be that it probably is more distracting than helpful, and I don't recommend it. But again, we need some controlled research to really help us with that direction. Now, physical activity, again, we need some, some good research to show the value of physical activity, um, how often it should occur, how frequently students should take breaks. But we do know that physically fit students, students who have gotten lots of physical activity, and there is research showing this, um, do much better academically on high stakes testing, on achievement testing. Um, we also know that physical activity increases something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is the, the uh, chemicals in the brain that drive the brain to change, that promote neuroplasticity. So activity is important, but activity while learning has not been demonstrated to be more effective or less effective at this point in time. Great. Here's another one. What standardized tools or informal checklists have you found to be most useful for older students with suspected but not yet, yet diagnosed ASD? Okay, I'd like to recommend two. Probably most of the people in the audience know about the autism spectrum quotient. It is my favorite. It's what I like to use the most because it is a checklist. It has questions on it if you're not familiar with it, like I prefer to do things with others rather than on my own. I prefer to do things the same way over and over again. If I try to imagine something, I find it very easy to create a picture in my mind. Um, and you can get it at, there is an online source for it, psychology-tools.com, autism spectrum quotient. Um, and it is by Simon Baron Cohen and, and has been around for almost, 15 years or so, and it is used quite a lot with older individuals. He also has a um, excellent test he's developed and some good research on it called the Reading the Mind in the Eyes test. Um, and there's some nice research on how it correlates with the autism spectrum quotient. Um, and the research was published uh, uh, through the Departments of Experimental Psychology and Psychiatry at the Autism Research a center in Cambridge. And though that is available, actually both of those are also available if you go to Google Scholar. So those are my two favorite. There are others, but those are the ones I like the best. The approaches you suggested apply in telehealth. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do a lot of telepractice with adolescents and adults. I probably do, right now, I have four adolescents and young adults that I'm working with in telepractice. And almost all of the methods that I've shared with you, whether it's 
keeping planners. Um, they can just scan me their planner, and I can look at it. Um, um, they can they can scan it and email it to me. Backwards goal setting. Um, the tigers, just the preparation before they go to school, all of those kinds of things you can set up and work with the families. I actually love telepractice because I can work not only with the students themselves but with the families to make sure they're implementing them. But all of them are um, easily adaptable to telepractice. That, that's absolutely fascinating to hear. Um, are there any approaches that are more effective or different for treating girls with ASD uh, or attention deficits versus boys with the same needs? Not that I know of. Um, that is a really good question because girls do present a little bit differently than boys. But generally speaking, where the evidence basis is, is in individualizing each program for the student, regardless of whether it's a girl or a boy. So let's talk about, for example, if we were using backwards goal setting, a girl's goals are going to be different than a boy's goals. And and someone else asked, I noticed online, a question about how do you make how do you get the students to provide realistic goals? And that's where you really individualize what you're doing. So if a student if on the autism spectrum says to me that what they want to be is a um, is a reporter of the news, um, then that's a goal that probably is is too lofty for them right now where they are. So I try to back them up a little bit and get to a more realistic goal, but I always individualize to the student. I don't come in to any intervention with an idea of what goals they should have. I don't come in into an intervention with an idea of what their planner should include. We work on that together based on their needs and based on what where they want to go. Um, and you can find almost all students, even those on the autism spectrum, do have the capacity for making some realistic goals. Even if it's something like I want to be able to build computer games, a lot of them will be capable of doing something like that or working for a technology company. So that might be a very good realistic goal for them to start with, let's start with working with a technology company. How do you have to do in math? How do you have to do in your math class? So um, individualizing is probably much more important than worrying about the sex. So what are your suggestions for getting high-functioning students to buy into the strategy being implemented? The listener knows that older students are often seeking independence and self-determination, so they sometimes push back. Yeah, that is tough um, because part of the the brain of an adolescent is to separate from adults. So a big part of what the brain is doing during adolescence is pulling away from rules and structures and adult control and adult guidance. And because of that, what we have to do is is again build it from their goals. So it has to be very student-centered what we do. It can't be centered in our expectations of the student necessarily. Um, obviously, we want our expectations ultimately to be met, but we have to have the students start to see that they are the individual who can accomplish their goals. They are the person who can work toward these. So finding what's important to them, figuring out how what is important to them. Maybe it's being popular. Um, maybe it's having more friends than they have. Maybe then what we start with is going to the movies with a friend on Friday night, um, finding a friend, inviting them to a movie. How do you do that? How do you pick the movie? How, how do you let that your friend decide what the movie is and compromise? So always bringing it back, starting with what is important to them and bringing it back. It's going to help you get more buy-in than if you come in with a self-imposed idea of what you expect of them. You know, I thought a couple of times as you were talking about strategies for attention that, uh, that they might apply to adults in some cases as well. We, we all live such distracted lives these days. Um, so how do the strategies you suggest translate to post-school work life, if at all? Um, actually, I'm working with a couple of adults right now in work-related um, settings. I have one young man who um, has a history of drug abuse. He's just finished a drug rehab program, um, and we are doing the same kind of activities, the same kind of attentional activities, the same kind of organizational activities, 
Um, I actually have started with him on the backwards goal setting to set realistic goals for himself, um, how he's going to find a job, what kind of job search he's going to do, and how he's going to strategize for interviews, um, how he's developing his resume. All of these are exactly the same kind of goals I would use with high school students. It's just the content differs. So the, the, the approaches are the same. The content just differs when you're talking about adult life and work. Great. I think my mom submitted this next question. Here it is. <laughs> it's true that too much early TV watching contributes to attention disorders. All right. There is some preliminary uh, research that was done a few years ago showing that uh, students who have increased screen time are at more risk for attention deficit disorder. What you don't know from that research, though, because it wasn't a controlled um, study, is you don't know if the students who ended up with attention deficit disorder watched more or spent more time on TV or um, screen time because they had attention deficit disorder um, that was emerging. But what I'd like to lead all of our um, listeners to is the American Psychiatric Association. Um, the American Psychiatric Association, or sorry, the, I don't mean psychiatric, the American Pediatric Association, the, AP, the APA, has a wonderful website. Um, that you can access uh, to get information about recommendations for screen time. And I'm just going to give you um, the website itself is just www.aap.org. And they have, if you just search for managing medium media, they talk about that excessive media. Now, not this isn't just television. It's also technology. It's smartphones. It's all those things. Excessive, excessive media has been associated with obesity, lack of sleep, school problems, aggression, and behavioral issues. They cite some of the research there. And then they recommend that we monitor as parents and teachers not only the amount of time children spend with these media devices, but also content. There's good content on a television. There's not so good content. There's good content on iPads. There's not so good content. Um, and generally, you may know that the American Pediatric Association recommends no more than two hours a day. And the recommendation is really one to two hours a day, no more than that, for screen time or media time for students. Um, I like to tell parents that the best way to use media is as a reward. So TV should be used or computer time or going on Facebook as a reward after homework is done, after after the meal time. And just a couple of other things that the American Pediatric Association recommends is no televisions in bedrooms. So trying to keep the technology away from the bedroom so the student doesn't stay up till 2 or 3 in the morning um, playing around on Facebook or something like that. So it's a wonderful source for information on the research. How do you motivate children that seem not to care anymore? One listener is citing a story of a child um, who has a history of failing grades and who thinks that no amount of effort matters or will make an impact. That's really tough, and it's actually more common than you might think. Um, the vast majority of adolescents I deal with have the problem that they've given up. Uh, they've failed repeatedly in school. They've always gotten poor grades. Students know who teachers think are smart and, non, and not smart. They figure that out at a young age. Um, and they start to get discouraged very easily. One of the reasons neuroscience emphasizes reward is that by, by providing those students with rewards, now it doesn't mean that they get an A on a paper, but it might mean that they get rewarded for handing their paper in on time, that they get rewarded for um, an effort that goes into doing work as opposed to only looking at the outcome of what they do. And if you can build that in incrementally, where you build in incentives rather than punishments, um, that can be helpful. Another thing that can be very helpful, again, is, 
is some of the technological programs because the technological programs that were developed by neuroscientists have been designed to reward the student and keep them at about the level of about 80% correct all the time, which makes them feel like they're successful. So I've had many students who've gone through some of the technological cognitive programs that are available um, who suddenly have a boost in their self-confidence and their, a boost in their, their belief that they can learn. So neuroscience can help us because neuroscience is studying and has a lot of research available, and you can look it up on Google Scholar very easily, on how you build up incremental to success to, to eliminate this defeatist attitude that, that older students get after lots of failure. So we only have a few minutes left here. Let's try and get to a few other questions. Uh, here's another listener. You showed some great tools for helping students be more organized, but how do I help very intelligent high school students with AFD and ADHD want to become more organized? Is that possible <laughs> without intrinsic motivation? <laughs> well, adolescents generally are not motivated to be organized um, in general. They're, organ they're motivated to have lots of friends. They're, they're motivated to take risks. They're motivated to do a lot of things that we would rather they didn't do. Um, and I know a lot of adults who aren't particularly motivated to be organized either. Um, so what we have to do is begin by providing them with organizational structure ourselves. I often say to parents and teachers, you are your students' frontal lobes. You are their organization. And if you are organized and if they have a structure, you can start very slowly and very incrementally building in organizational structure that isn't, doesn't seem overwhelming to them, like keeping their planner. And, it, and if you reward them for keeping a planner, just something as simple as keeping a planner, and they get a reward for keeping that planner and being accurate with it, and the reward might be something as simple as being able to order a pizza on Friday or being able to watch an extra half an hour of TV um, over the weekend. You, by building in the rewards for organization, that's what the frontal lobe uses to build itself is reward. It is a reward it is a reward-centered system that overrides your limbic system. So reward is the key, providing the structure, providing the students with the organizational methods, then rewarding them for using them. And start small. Don't start big. Don't expect them to have everything organized right away. Look, this has been fantastic. Uh, before we close, I noticed that several of our listeners sent in questions about the many terrific resources that Marty recommended during today's webinar. Uh, we have some good news for you on that front. Uh, we sent out an email this morning with a PDF that has links to everything listed. We'll be sending it out again with our follow-up email to everyone who registered or attended. Uh, but I think the most important thing here is to give a huge thanks to Marty for giving us a huge treasure chest of resources and information for uh, informing us on a very important topic uh, and really for her leadership in this area, which doesn't get uh, enough focus um, and enough um, uh, research in a lot of ways, given the magnitude of the problem and uh, the issues we're all struggling with to help children in these age groups. So thank you, Marty, for all that you do and for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Clay. So right now, presence learning is growing rapidly. We're serving thousands of students in schools across the country and internationally. I hear amazing success stories every day about the work of our clinicians and the impact they have on our students' lives. If someone you know is interested in working with our top-notch team on a flexible schedule to change the lives of children through telehealth, please refer them to our website to learn more about working online with presence learning. We invite you all to join us for the fourth webinar in our Spring Special Agents of Change series. Joining us is special education consultant Dr. Frances Stetson with her special style of storytelling. She'll be addressing the five major pitfalls to avoid in reimagining special education programs. And based on rave reviews we've heard from those who have heard Frances present her words of wisdom to a live audience, this is one that is a must not miss. You can register at plearn.co forward slash change hyphen 2015. That's P-L-E-A-R-N dot C-O slash change hyphen 2015. 
We'll ask your email for a certificate of attendance and links to the recording of today's program. Please share the link and PDF of the slides with your colleagues. For people who've provided ASHA info, we'll be submitting your attendance information to ASHA for CEUs. No further action is needed on your part. Please note that it may take six weeks or so for them to update your records. And finally, thank you from everyone at Presence Learning. We are committed to providing highly personalized online therapy and special education instruction with the best professionals to help unlock the potential of every child. Your feedback on these webinar programs is important to us. At the conclusion of today's program, you'll be directed to a feedback survey for today's webinar. Please let us know what you thought about the program. For more info or a live demo of Presence Learning's online therapy services, please email us at schools at presencelearning.com. Thanks to the Presence team that puts it together, and thanks to Marty, and thanks above all to our listeners. Have a good day.